Hi, you're watching Floyd Steinberg's YouTube channel. Remember the day in school in fifth grade when you asked your math teacher, why am I learning all this stuff? And he calmly replied, because one day you can create your own MIDI sequencer using WebMIDI, JavaScript, a random MIDI controller and a Raspberry Pi. Me neither. But anyway, that's what we're going to do here today. And um, I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details of the program itself. If you're interested in that, please take a look at the source code linked in this video's description. But instead, I'm going to explain the broader strokes and ideas behind all this and how it works behind the scenes. And in the end, there will also be a short demo using that sequencer. So make sure to stick around. Yeah, let's go. So, to create your own sequencer, you need to understand three things. First thing, obviously, how timing and harmony works in Western music. If you're watching this channel, chances are you already know that. So, let's move on to the second thing, how MIDI works. MIDI is an abbreviation for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, and it's been around since the early 80s. You know it from those old 5-pin cables and modern-day USB connectors, but there's also a protocol that all these instruments know in order to communicate with each other. This works by sending three bytes of information from one device to another. A byte is a binary number made up from eight digits that are either zero or one. In order to get the decimal value represented by that, you write down those numbers in a table, which ranges from 128 to zero in a descending order, like this. And now, write down the binary number you're going to convert to the decimal in the line below that, like this, and then add up all the columns which contain one. So for example, in this case, we've got 92, because that's 64 plus 16 plus eight plus four. As you can see, the maximum number you can write down this way is 11111111, which translates to 255. And that's the reason why all parameters in your synth or your digital auto workstation max out at that value. As I said before, MIDI is a protocol which is a list of commands which carry three bytes of information each. The first byte of a MIDI command tells your synth what type of command is issued and which MIDI channel it's sent to. The second and the third byte carry parameter information. For example, if you play a note, the first one contains the note pitch and the second one its velocity. Now, the reason I talk about these binary numbers is because the first byte of a MIDI command is split up into two halves of four bit each. The first four digits represent the type of command you're sending, and the other four digits represent the channel you're sending on. Now, four digits of binary max out at the decimal number of 15, so that's why there are 16 MIDI channels, and they're numbered null or 0 to 15. Let's take a look at how to get the correct binary code for sending a note on command on channel 10 to your synthesizer. The MIDI binary code for note on is 1001, so that's the first part. Let's write it down. And 10, or the channel we're sending to, is written down as 1010. So now let's just uh, put these numbers together, and we've got 1001, 1010. And now we need to convert this to decimal, so we write down a table once again and the resulting decibel number is 154. In order to understand those two parameters, you need to know that MIDI knows 128 note pitches, and the lowest note note is A0, which is at number 21. So 22 is A sharp 0, 23 is B0, and so on. And now let's put all this together and we're sending three bytes to a synth, which are 154, 48, and 100. So this means we will trigger a C3 on channel 10 with a velocity of 100 out of 127. And this note will now be held until you send the note off command on the same channel to your synthesizer. So let's calculate that command too. 
So the node off command is 1000 and the channel is still represented by 1010. So the resulting binary code is 1000-1010, which then translates to a decimal number of 138. So in conclusion, we need to send 138 48 100 to our synth and then the note will stop playing. Now I could go on forever on other MIDI commands and control changes and stuff, but instead I'll just put some links in this video's description uh, explaining the MIDI protocol. Okay, so now we got two parts of the puzzle, rhythm and harmony in western music, the mathematical whereabouts of the MIDI protocol, and now let's take a look at the third part of the puzzle, which is the way modern browsers work. So, again, we can break that down into three parts, and the first part is web MIDI. And I won't go into detail here, you just need to know that uh, some years ago, Chrome introduced the web MIDI API, and API is an abbreviation for Application Programmers Interface, which is a fancy way of saying there are commands for programmers, which enable you to talk to your MIDI devices. And I'm not going into detail on this, you can look it up on the internet and just take a look at the source code of my app I'll link in this video's description. Yeah, that's one part. The second part um, are web workers. This is again a fancy way of saying that browsers can now perform certain tasks in the background independent of the rendering stuff going on for your web page which again leads to a more stable timing, which is ideal for uh, yeah, creating a sequencer. And yeah, these web workers can't talk to your web page directly, but instead you can send signals to them and they can send back signals to your web page. And we'll take a look at how that works later. And the third part is that modern browsers view a web page like a kind of database. This is called the document object model, and it's important to us because browsers re can retrieve information from the document they're displaying like super fast, okay? Yeah, and so the idea behind my sequencer is to create a background task which basically counts milliseconds in the background and then sends a signal to the browser each time a certain interval has passed. The length of that interval, of course, is dependent on the musical tempo you're playing at. Referring the intro of this video, calculating that interval is really easy. For example, we have 16 steps in our musical sequence in my example, and we want to play it at a number of 120 beats per minute. Now, a beat refers to a quaver or quarter note in Western music. And so first, we need to divide 60 seconds by 120, which is 0.5, which means we need to play a beat every half second if we have a tempo of 120 beats per minute that's obvious now we need to divide that by 16 because we have 16 steps and that results in 0 0.03125 okay so if we're playing 16th notes at 120 beats per minute we need to play a note each 0.03 seconds yeah but because we're measuring in thousandths seconds here, we need to multiply that value by thousand, which leads us to 31.25. So in other words, our background task will send a signal to the browser to continue playing every 31th cycle. So that means 31 thousandths seconds have passed, and then uh, it will ping the browser to play the next step. By the way, if you want your music to groove, we need to swing. And this means each other note is played slightly delayed, and swing is notated in percent, which refers to how much time the first beat is longer than the second beat. So let's take a swing value of, for example, 15%. We know that at 120 beats per minute, the length of our interval is 31 milliseconds, so now we can calculate the length of the first beat at the swing value of 15%. So the calculation is 100 minus 15 times 31 divided by 100. And that results in 26.35 or 26 rounded. But in order to play that swing, we need to take the difference between the original step length, 
and the swing value, which is 31 minus 26, and that is 5. Now, in order to play the groovy beat, at a 15% swing value, we need to add that 5 milliseconds to the first beat and subtract 5 seconds from the second beat, and then we reset the counter and begin again. Okay, but let's return to the third part of a puzzle, the document object model. As I said, modern browsers are super efficient at retrieving all kinds of data from web pages. So the idea here is you can literally create a box with a list in it and just read what's in the list and then send it to your synthesizer. And you can make that list look really fancy by applying a set of design rules, but um, you don't need to. So in this example, if we're adding tracks or a pattern, the browser literally does a clone of that list and that box, which is already there, and then appends it to your web page. And it's just changing the track number information contained in that box, okay? And then muting a track, for example, is achieved by hiding the box from the document, and um, yeah, and so on. Okay, we've got the background task ticking away at every 30 milliseconds or so. It sends a signal to the browser please read entry 4 in list number 2 on device 1 and begin again at the first step when we reached the last step. And that's how the sequencer works. Getting this to run was a fun challenge and the most annoying part was getting rid of hanging notes because the note of command was in the wrong place. At and adding the ability to change the note length added a nice bit of complexity to this experiment. And now I'm going to demonstrate my sequencer and I show you how I solved some actual real-world problems like selecting instruments, uh, laying out the user interface on my MIDI controller and so on. Here we go. So this is the setup I use with the sequencer. This is Nano Control, one of the cheapest MIDI controls available. It has some LEDs that my sequencer uses to show the track you're working on at the moment. So when I press these buttons, you can see on the screen capture the tracks are changing. The upper two rows of buttons are used for selecting one of the 16 steps in the pattern. Press one of these and play a note on any keyboard connected to your PC to lock a note in place or you can turn this knob to adjust the note pitch. The other knobs are used for adjusting the length of a note, changing velocity, and for copying the note you selected to all the other steps, for example, filling a pattern with 16th hi-hat notes. We also have a tempo selector and a knob for adjusting swing strength. Okay, let's try short jam. This controller is connected to my Yamaha EX5, one of those huge workstations. I'm holding the cycle button, which is a pattern select in my setup here, while pressing the first track selector button, which selects pattern 1. After releasing the cycle button, I choose the fourth track, which is the drum track here. Now I can hold the first step button and play a note on the keyboard, in this case F sharp 3, which is a closed hi-hat sound. And now I'm going to press play to start the sequencer, and you can see the step LEDs lighting up there. Now I'm going to fill 16 steps with hi-hat notes using the fill knob, and take a look at the screen capture to see how this works. This knob adjusts swing, so let's add a bit of that. Okay, so now I'm going to fill in the bass and snare drums. Switching to track 5 for the bass sound now.
Now I'm going to copy this pattern by holding the pattern button and pressing one of the track selector buttons. Next I'm going to transpose the whole bass track 5 steps downwards by holding the track button and turning the pitch knob. Adding some fills on track 1 and track 8 now. Here's a pad sound from the Reface DX over here. Changing patterns now, and you can easily queue up some pattern changes by pressing these buttons multiple times. Okay, enough of this. And that's it for today. I hope you found this interesting and useful. And if you did, please consider subscribing to my channel. And as always, thanks for watching. And see you again very, very soon. Bye bye.